Hey scholars, welcome back to seven, chapter seven of your uh, AP textbook. We're taking a look at seven two. How does climate affect the na nature and locations of biomes? So how do we talk, let's specifically look at how climate literally affects the shape, look, and the different biomes of the earth. Of the earth. So we're going to take a look at that today. If you take a look at our Earth's major biomes, this just shows you a whole kind of a brief picture of everything, uh, all the way from where we live in the uh, temperate deciduous, which is kind of more like, I don't even know, more, I guess it's temperate deciduous, I think more like a chaparral because of how, how, how many pine trees and coniferous trees that we have. And located in the north of us, we have the coniferous forest and dark green, the, um, the temperate grasslands of the savanna, even in the desert, which we talked about last section, with our, which is caused by our rain shadow effect. Um, your uh, temperate deciduous forest again, your chaparral, um, even with, what else we can talk about? Uh, we talk about deserts, tropical rainforests um, out in this region. So lots of different types of biomes on Earth, all the way down to polar ice caps in, um, what is it, uh, Greenland, which is really ice full of ice, and uh, Iceland, which is full of green. But we're looking at this as Greenland, so it's covered in ice. So just kind of looking at some of those things. So one of the things we're going to look at is general effects of ele elevation and latitude on, on climate and biomes. And so uh, obviously as you get higher in elevation, usually you get colder because you're higher in the atmosphere, not as much heat molecules because it um, uh, just, just how it works. So mountains, ice and snow up in the ele upper elevations, the tundra, you have lichens, and then as you get lower in elevation, you're going to coniferous. Um, so <laughs> as you go as you lower in elevation, you have coniferous forests, deciduous forests, and then even lower, you have tropical rainforests as far as elevation goes going up. Now, as you go in latitude away from the equator, which is tropical forest, good, located at the equator, moving away from the equator, you have deciduous forest, coniferous forest, tundra, and polar ice. And depending on where you're located, that could also, in, in, your, in your convection cell, could have some deserts in there as well, or grasslands. So just taking a look at some of those general effects of latitude, looking at latitude, and how that shapes biomes as well. This is a really, really cool picture. I really like this picture a lot. It's a unique image, um, but it does bring in every factor, temperature and precipitation, as far as the whole Earth is concerned. So if you look at some of these things, it really combines where the moisture content is and temperature. So as you increase temperature and you have more moisture, you get rainforests, right? As you get away from temperature, um, you're still staying relatively moist. You have deciduous forests, and then you increase temperature even more. You have coniferous forests, and then all the way down to your cold uh, tundra. And as you, as you uh, decrease in precipitation, as well as you stay hot, you're staying with shrubland, savanna, and then eventually tropical uh, deserts with that high moisture content. Well, well decreasing in moisture content, but you all, you're still very, very hot. When you look in the, uh, as you get a little bit uh, cooler and you're still going, again, less, less moisture, chaparral, grasslands, then the temperate deserts. And then kind of as you're getting even less hot, um, you have subpolar deserts and, and then even further into the polar deserts, which is basically like a tundra is very similar to a polar desert. It's actually can, can classified as a desert. So interesting stuff. Um, science focus, staying alive in the desert. We're going to watch a whole episode of Survivor Man um, on Friday just to take a look at some different plant adaptations. And he talked about them, that he actually uses some of them in his quest for survival in the desert. So while well, he also talks about animal strategies and how they have adapted to living in such hot, dry, dry climates with even some cooler nights, which you'll see as well as he's staying in a temperate desert. So we'll take a look at that uh, on Friday. So uh, there are there are three major types of deserts. So we're going to look at, or basically there's three different types. We classify everything as three different types. Deserts, um, grasslands, and forests. And we're going to talk about deserts first. And there are three major types of deserts. The first one is the tropical desert. It's really hot and dry all year. Um, before I get started, though, I should actually say you, sh you, you will need to know this, not only for the quiz, but for your first six weeks exam, as well as your AP exam, you need to know the characteristics not all of only of, of precipitation and temperature of every single type of biome. So I'm just giving you a heads up on that. But our first one is tropical desert. A great example, the Sahara and the Namib Desert, very, very hot and dry all year long. And those are a good example of a tropical desert, kind of dangerous to, to, be, to be trapped in. Uh, temperate deserts are the Mojave, kind of like in our uh, North America, looking at daytime temperatures, very high in the summer very low in the winter, and you have some average precipitation. You do get some moisture. Then you have the cold deserts, like the Gobi. Uh, wind, winters are very cold. Summers are warm and hot with low precipitation. Uh, but all these are very, very fragile ecosystems. They very have little, very little plant growth. 
um, uh, because the remember moisture and water is a key component of photosynthesis. So those, those organisms are very, you know there's not a whole lot that can go there because they're not getting as much moisture, so not a lot of plants grow there. So that's another reason why there's slow plant growth. Very low species diversity. Only a few species have really adapted to live in that kind of climate. So that's another thing there. Uh, slow nutrient recycling is maybe because nutrients are really tied into the hydrologic cycle and we're not getting a lot of that hydrologic cycle in the desert, you're very, very slow at nutrient cycling, so not a whole lot of nutrients in the desert, which is why we don't farm there. Well, we try not to anyway. Um, also, lack of water, um, obviously, because it's a desert. So those are just a few characteristics of the three major types of deserts. And you can see that we're actually going to create these. These are called climatograms. And we're going to take a look at these on Thursday and Friday. And that's just showing you um, on one axis, um, looking at temperature. The other axis, looking at precipitation. I believe precipitation is in blue here and temperature excuse me, is in red. So those are just like going to look at a climatogram. You're going to make these for different types of biomes. I'm going to give you some data. You're actually going to create these on Thursday. But I just want to share these with you today. So there are also three types of, types of grasslands. The first one is the tropical grasslands, or, uh, or aka the savannas. They are very, have very widely scattered clumps of trees, um, warm temperatures year-round with some alternating dry and wet seasons, sometimes called a monsoon season. Um, but those are the tropical savannas, mostly seen um, out in Africa. You know, AKA the uh, Lion King habitat would be a great example of the savanna. Um, temperate are your winters are cold, summers are hot and dry, annual precipitation is very, uh, it's kind of sparse, uneven throughout the year, um, but temperate kind of not as, not as hot, not as cold as necessarily uh, the, tro oh, the, the tropical um, savannas. Well, I should say they're more cold than they are, than they are hot. Um, cold and Arctic, uh, this is the Arctic tundra, which is known as a grassland, no trees, very cold, winters are long, dark, precipitation is not in a liquid form, but in a solid form, aka snow, and so therefore, those are your three different types and characteristics of grasslands. There are also three major types of, uh, of, of grasslands that have continued here. The tropical, uh, this, we're looking at animals as far as, as, far as uh, animals that have adapted. Uh, grazing animals and browsing animals, animals in the tropical savanna like uh, zebras, gazelles, also like dry ass, all sorts of stuff. Um, temperate, you have tall grass prairies like prairie dogs, uh, black-footed ferrets, pronghorn antelope, and there's also short grass prairies, but all of those, uh, those animals can live in that kind of climate. And also the Arctic tundra, probably the most fragile of all the biomes. It has very slim adaptations of plants and animals. Uh, it also has permafrost, which basically, if you don't know the definition of permafrost, is where the soil has been, has been captured by water and frozen for two consecutive years. So not a great, plants, not a great place to grow plants because the water is in solid form underneath the ground, and the plants can't really deal with that. So that's why there's very, very low adaptations to plants and animals. Not a whole lot of plant species or animal species live there. And the alpine tundra is a, a variation of the Arctic tundra. It is in high mountains, so higher elevations. They get more sunlight. They get a little more plants. Um, that's what we call the alpine tundra. And then here is the, uh, the climatograms for those three types of grasslands. Your tropical savanna, your temperate grassland, and your cold grassland with awesome, beautiful scenery pictures uh, beside them. So one of the biggest things and why we don't see too many uh, temperate grasslands in North America is because they are been, have been utilized for growing crops. We have monoculture, monocultured crops, basically means we're only growing one crop at a time and replacing kind of the biologically diverse temperate grassland. Because it has some pretty decent soil for us to use in a temperate climate, we have kind of monopolized that ecosystem for specifically for growing crops for us to consume as human beings. So talk about your human impact there. So just want to share that little brief clip with you on, on, uh, on temperate grasslands. All right, temperate shrublands, a nice climate, risky place to live though, like the chaparral. I showed you that picture and it was in kind of southern, in the middle of California. Well, if you know anything about California, they are very, very prone to fires. Um, and you, know, you hear about fires, big full wildfires happening in California all the time. And that is because they're near the sea, nice climate, but very, very dry. And they are very prone to fires in the dry season. That's usually where a lot of your forest fires occur. Which is why I kind of, uh, you know, if you think of a few years back, we've had forest fires in our and around our area, uh, I mean, every summer that I've lived in North Carolina. So I've, I really think that our climate, because we are so close to the coast, is more like a chaparral than it really is a tempered deciduous forest. But that's just my opinion and not what the book says, but that's just my opinion. So this is just looking at chaparral vegetation. Again, another climatogram showing precipitation and also temperature on your double y-axis graph. All right, there are three major types of forests, which is, we were talking about the tropical rainforest. It's near the equator, very hot, moist, lots of moisture. It's where all the, the uh, precipitation occurs, lots of rain. And then you have your temperate deciduous forest, which, again, you're supposed to live in, more like so in the mountains, like Raleigh area, I would consider temperate deciduous slash coniferous forest. And then it, your cold uh, forests, which are your northern boreal forests, 
Um, very, very cold up in the mountains, um, kind of dark, gloomy, things like that. But those are your three different types of forests. Um, we're looking at a tropical rainforest specifically. These are, again, lots of temperature, high temperatures, and high moisture content. We have a stratification of specialized plants and animal niches. Now, what I mean by that is stratification means in layers. So what happens is, is that there are so much nutrients and so many, so much uh, you know, or, uh, different nutrients and energy to be passed on through that ecosystem that organisms have literally specially adapted to, you, to live in different parts and different layers of the forest. Um, very little wind, which is kind of significant, kind of keeps all those nutrients and those things kind of there. Um, it holds, there's not a whole lot of erosion by wind, so there's a lot of soil and good uh, nutri nutrient soil there. Um, rapid recycling of the scarce soil nutrients because these, there's not a lot of soil nutrients because the plants are continuously growing all the time and using all those nutrients. That's why we have such a huge, vast range of plants there. And also, you're impacting the activities. We're deforesting the, the rainforest, if you haven't heard, in the past 20 years um, to, to use for monocultureing our own crops because if we did have to remove those trees, there probably would be some good nutrients there to grow crops for us as well as to clear out areas for housing. So those are some things about the tropical forest. Then you have the temperate deciduous forest. Again, we have broadleaf trees like your oaks, go white oak, um, your uh, maple trees, your sycamores, all those are very broadleaf big leaves for capturing as much sunlight as they possibly can for photosynthesis. Our, our decomposition rate is a lot slower because of the fact that we have so many leaves falling off the trees that organisms have a hard time keeping up with that. So ten, sometimes you tend to get lots of leaf litter piled up in your forest because the organisms are just taking their time to decompose it for us. Um, impact of human activities, again, this is probably the area that we've inhabited the most other than the grasslands in the United States because it's just a good climate for us, um, beautiful place to live, you know, all sorts of good stuff. But we've really monopolized this area for housing and living. And our last one are the evergreen coniferous forests, or the boreal slash taigas. Um, these are temperate, uh, very, very temperature uh, prone there, lots of highs and lows, more, more lows than anything, um, but um, high in moisture content still. A um, few species of, of cone-bearing plants, bearing trees, slow decomposition. Um, you know, we have you know, very slow decomposition because there's not anything losing leaves. Um, so the significance is there, there's not a whole lot of organisms um, eating those, so that's why you see a lot of times you'll see underneath pine trees tons of needles all over the place. Um, so that's a very slow decomposition because they don't really break down very well because of uh, bacteria and different uh, detritivores. All right, and there's the three climatograms for these guys. Again, showing precipitation and temperature on your double y-axis graph and beautiful images to accompany them. And this just shows that uh, kind of stratification and different organisms. It shows you a, a, a food web, which we looked at in Chapter 3, definitely with our Owl Pellets Lab. But this just shows you the different organisms, how they've kind of adapted to different um, layers or stratif strat strat uh, stratification of the, of the Amazon or the, or the rainforest. It's just an example of the Amazon rainforest. And that just shows you that. This shows you the actual stratification looking at, at in meters, height in meters, looking at which organisms have adapted the different layers, the ground layer, the shrub layer, understory, canopy, and then the emergent layer, which actually does get sunlight, and you can see which kind of organisms inhabit those in the tropical rainforest. All right. The mountains play an important ecological role. Again, we talked about the mountains and the, the rain shadow effect last section in seven, section 7.1, but they are, hold the majority of the world's forest. They are great habitats for endemic species, where they're only located in the, in the mountains. Um, and, uh, we also find new species in the mountains all the time because we just don't explore there that often. Um, it helps regulate the Earth's climate, um, you know, causing different uh, uh, weather patterns and, and climate changes because of the flow of, of, of the atmosphere or the winds from high to low or low to high, vice versa. They can affect sea levels as well because they can be storehouses for ice. That if we're melted, they can they actually rot. When when those uh, throughout the year, when those uh, mountain ranges or tops mountains actually melt, then you have more. The sea level rises a little bit, and then it obviously through the cycle actually brings gets back back up there in the winter time or in the cold season. And so they are major storehouses of water in those areas, and they could they play a major role in the hydrologic cycle. And there's a beautiful image of Mount Rainier National Park in Washington State, the United States, and that concludes section seven two.